Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy webinar, Climate Refugees, Supporting Receiving Communities. My name is Austin Snowmarger, and I am the Manager of Learning and Partnerships at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. My pronouns are he, him, his. Some quick reminders before we get started. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the panel presentation. If you are on Twitter, please use hashtag CDP for recovery. That's CDP, the number four, recovery, to share and join the discussion. And don't forget to follow us at Funds for Disaster. At the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete this to help us improve our webinar offerings to better meet your needs. And finally, we are recording this webinar. It will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. Live captioning is available now via Zoom. Click on closed caption live transcript to access it. More accurate captions in the recording. This webinar is co-sponsored by Alliance Magazine, Charity Navigator, Council on Foundations, Giving Compass, Philanthropy California, Philanthropy New York, Philanthropy Southeast, The Funders Network, and United Philanthropy Forum. We thank them all for their support. As we begin the webinar, CDP acknowledges that we are working from the stolen lands of the many original peoples. We recognize that indigenous peoples have been displaced and disenfranchised from their land by the socioeconomic and cultural disaster of colonialism, as well as disasters. We acknowledge when the US was founded, there were exclusions and erasures of indigenous knowledge about how to appropriately care for these lands, causing environmental destruction and degradation which has had a significant impact on disaster risk and on communities. We are committed to dismantling the ongoing legacies, systems, and structures of settler colonialism and white supremacy. We commit ourselves to understand where and how wealth accumulation has harmed people and the earth itself and the complexities of philanthropy as connected to that truth. Despite centuries of theft, violence, and murder, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Please join us and acknowledge the original peoples and their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. At the end of the webinar, funders will have an increased understanding of the debate around the term climate refugees, identify ways to support adaptation measures in receiving communities, learn more about current needs and issues from different locations worldwide. Our naming of this webinar to include the phrase climate refugees was deliberate because it is a contentious phrase and we wanted our speakers to interrogate it and they will do so shortly. In 1985, United Nations environment program expert Assam El Hinawawi defined climate or environmental refugees as people who have been forced to leave their traditional habitat temporarily or permanently because of marked environmental disruption. The phrase is controversial for a number of reasons. In particular, climate refugees are not accorded the same rights as other refugees. In 2018, the United Nations Human Rights Council called them the world's forgotten victims. In the US, there has been some discussion about awarding these people temporary protected status, but that has not yet materialized. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest report stated that Climate change is one of several multi-dimensional factors contributing to forced light movement today, and that peace and mobility are at a significant risk from its effects. Without global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and better adapt to the effects of climate change, the authors say the number of people displaced will grow in the coming decades. As this next chart shows, there were 17.2 million new disaster displacements in 2018. Of these, the majority, 16.1 million, were weather related. The three top causes were storms, cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons, and floods. The other displacements were geophysical, mostly earthquakes. In the introduction to their book, Global Views on Climate Relocation and Social Justice, Navigating Retreat, authors Idou Jola Ajibad and A.R. Siders 
say climate change is already redefining the landscapes of risk around the globe, from rising seas and shoreline erosion in small island states to heat waves and massive flooding in Europe, Asia, and Africa, and expanding wildfires and heat dome in the American West. These events are intensifying patterns of displacement, migration, and relocation within and between countries. In the last two decades, over 480 million people were displaced globally by climate-related disasters. From 2000 to 2019, over 7,000 climate-related disasters killed an estimated 1.23 million people and caused $2.97 trillion in economic losses. During this time, an average of 24 million people were displaced per year globally. These displacements are not experienced in isolation, but as part of the complex intersecting economic, social, political, and environmental crises that put severe strain on individual and community well-being across the world. By 2050, as many as 1 billion people could be displaced by a combination of climate change impacts, extreme events, and environmental degradation, and thus raising critical concerns about finding appropriate climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction strategies. In 2020, 30 million people were displaced and the number is growing constantly. Now it is my honor to introduce our very special guests. I am looking forward to the information they will share with us. First, Munir Khan is the program head for the climate change program at BRAC. He leads and manages BRAC's local level adaptation actions in the field. His expertise lies in management, strategic decision-making, planning, research, and implementation of annual operational activities. Over the last 20 years, Monir has established himself as a development practitioner with sound knowledge on adaptation action through academic engagements and project experiences in national and international arenas. Prior to joining BRAC, Monir worked at the UNDP, SIUC USA, AIT Thailand, IUCN Bangladesh, and BRAC University, contributing to valuable research work and development activities. Next, we have Sarah Jamieson, who leads operations at USA for IOM, the International Organization for Migration's arm for private sector engagement and awareness raising. She is motivated for, by strategic and innovative solutions for human rights-based approaches to migration and development, and helps develop USA for IOM's strategic vision for private sector engagement, supports current projects and prospective programming by co coordinating with diverse partners ranging from corporations to diaspora communities, and directs research and information sharing with relevant stakeholders. Sarah's previous experience includes assisting victims of human trafficking in Southeast Asia, providing resettlement services in the United States, and researching migrant vulnerabilities in the Balkans. Jano Anzaloni is the Executive Director of the Climate Initiative, a, a nonpartisan non organization that inspires to educate, empower, and activate 10 million youth around climate action by 2025. He joined TCI after a long tenure at the Red Cross, where he started as a youth volunteer in 1994 in Omaha, Nebraska. Most recently, Jono served as the head of disaster and crisis, preparedness, response, and recovery for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies for the Americas and Caribbean region, based in Panama, and also served as the vice president of international services at the American Red Cross, based in Washington, DC. Jono served as the Advi Advocacy Committee Chair for the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster from 2012 to 2015, and is currently the Vice Chair of the Craft Relief Emergency Fund. Since 2003, Jono has held teaching appointments in economics, disaster management, and leadership at colleges and universities across the country. Welcome to each of you, and thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Sarah, let's start with you. We often hear the phrase climate refugee. Why is that term problematic from a legal perspective, and what do you use at IOM? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and start you guys off with uh, 
this kind of conversation has been ongoing within uh, the UN and other uh, organizations addressing climate change and displacement. And even in preparing for this event, I was reminded by my colleague uh, who works in our migration environment and climate change department that IOM does not condone the term climate refugee, um, just, just as, as a disclaimer for Iowa women who I represent. There's several reasons for this. Um, I think some of them have already briefly been hit on, but the main one is that it, it often misrepresents the reality of how climate change impacts displacement and human mobility. Uh, first and foremost, it's usually internal um, and refugees require uh, exiting of a uh, crossing of borders, exiting of original country to a new country of origin. Oftentimes displacement is something that first allows people to move throughout their country. Um, the picture you see here on the first slide is actually a colleague and I in Somalia um, addressing climate change displacement, but these people have not yet crossed a border uh, due to climate change, even though they have been displaced internally. Additionally, if we use the phrase like climate refugee, it sometimes has a negative impact because it almost pigeonholes the, the reality for people who are impacted by multiple factors. Um, it, it also may cause unrealistic procedures that specifically require, you know, people to be impacted by an individual event instead of an ongoing drought. Or um, it could also, in another way, weaken the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention by adding this concept, if everyone is a refugee, then no one is a refugee. Um, so it's not so much that climate refugee is, is wrong, it just doesn't tell the full, full story. And it may actually work against the, the rights and the opportunities of the people impacted by climate change and displaced because of it. No, thank you for the context and helping us consider the full story. Lanier, let's go to you now. Brack uses the phrase climate migration and climate migrant. What do those terms mean for you and why do you use them? Um, first of all, thank you so much for in inviting me in there to this webinar for your information. The capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka, is a place for around 21 million people, which is already overcrowded. And also the city um, is the fastest growing mega city in the world around 2,000 2, migrants, mostly poor, arrive uh, the Bangladesh capital every day. It is well established that Bangladesh is one of the most affected victims of climate change. The coastal bed of the country is especially vulnerable because 30% of its, um, its land falls under the coast where around 35 million people live in. We know that two thirds of the land of Bangladesh is less than five meters in height from sea level and most of the land are located in the coastal region. Once the people living in the coastal belt are unable to stay due to climate change effect, how the country with a high density can accommodate such a large number of population in this small land? It is already mentioned in some reports that people are moving from the coastal belt. We know that many migrants have been pushed from their rural homes by the extreme weather or poor socioeconomic opportunity, which triggered the migration process. At the same time, river bank erosion, drought, cyclone, salinity, sea level rise, and flash floods are combined factors. So now our definition of climate migrants. A certain population of Bangladesh who had to migrate because of climate-related reasons called climate migrant, and the process is the climate migration. The process could be movement of the people from their place of residence and can occur when extreme weather events, such as cyclone, flood, drought, make areas temporarily uninhabitable. Climate change in the rural areas could amplify migration to urban centers. After cyclone Cedar in 2007 and Isla in 2009 had memorable ex uh, examples for us, basically which changes the rural ecosystem in southern part of Bangladesh. Thank you. No, thank you both. And, you know, words matter and terminology matters. So thank you both for providing perspective on that. Jano, I want to move to you now. When you were in Panama, what were the drivers you saw that forced people to migrate? 
Thanks for having me, Austin. And really, from the last site visit I did prior to moving back to the US and leading the climate initiative, um, is really in the context of uh, La Panita and the Darien, for those that, that follow the central corridor of the Americas leading to mass migration. And most of our partners, uh, IOM, UNHCR, um, as well as the other non-governmental organizations in La Panita that were really trying to listen um, to the stories that migrants were bringing with them really led to a number of, of key buckets. Um, I particularly like this infographic because it really shows the causal effect of so many of the elements that link back to um, climate change and much of the academic literature that really does show the general increase in migration flows that are largely driven by socio-political, but at the end of the day tied to the economic context in the countries of origins from so many of the community members that are making this, this journey. Um, so whether it be violence, unemployment, racism, uh, inequality, and overall increases in poverty in countries of origin, there are so many causal studies that have shown this linkage between the change in global temperatures resulting in more frequent and intensified droughts, typhoons, et cetera. And of course, um, leading people to have to make a very difficult decision on what for some people is three and four month long journeys to seek safety and shelter for themselves or for their families. Um, and in particular, in this very small town of La Panita, um, which is right along the Darien Gap, Colombia and Panama sharing the border, um, we're really you know, seeing a large concentration of just 2021, 45,000 people that are making this journey through the Darien Gap. And these aren't individuals strictly from Venezuela and Colombia, in fact, uh, most of the migrants that are passing through the Darien Gap are coming from very far places across the globe as a result of what we're seeing is this domino effect linked back to climate change. Thank you. And yeah, I agree this infographic is, is quite compelling at showing the interconnection between these different issues. Thank you. Uh, Manir, let's go to you. When we were talking before the webinar, you mentioned that leaving is often someone's last option. Why do they want to stay and what issues might they face in their new community? Um, first of all, why people are leaving. There are many reasons that why people are migrated from one place to another. The reasons are categorized in five groups according to Breck University study in 2014 livelihood, natural disaster, land use, safety and security, and basic services and facilities. The study has been done after Cyclone Isla in 2009. The study also found that livelihood sector is the primarily most impacted sector due to climate change. The impact domain has multiple dimensions, direct losses of production and livelihood, assets due to any sudden or rapid incidence of climate change. In the longer time period, it leads to un availability of job, increase in the non-working days, temporal and permanent loss of productivity of natural resources. Brack University study also stated that around 85% have changed their livelihood after the incidents of Isla in 2009 in two sub-districts in Shatkira. The cyclone Isla and Sido not only impacted the livelihood, but also have created impact to the other sector in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. After these two cyclones, it was reported that around 76.2% of the respondents have lost their water supply facilities in two sub-districts. Rahela Begum, a resident of Munshigonj, uh, she's uh, 65 years old, um, went through a very difficult time after month of Isla. She could not found a glass of fresh water to drink and spent horrible days in her life. She thought, things would be fine and she would be able to go back to normal within two or three days. But Isla is not like other previous disaster. It is a monster storm which 
wrecked havoc the freshwater sources. Even after 14 years of phyla, people are still relying on NGO or local administration for fresh drinking water. However, people who are living from the coastal areas of Bangladesh is really someone's last option because they love to stay their rural e ecosystem with their parents, relatives, most loving areas, school, friends, teacher, basically they love to stay with their own community. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And the second part of the question, um, what issue might be faced in their new community? When they move to a city, they are never welcomed and there is no such good place for them. So the slum is the only place for them, now home for 40% of the city population. In the rural areas, most of the poor people have been suffering due to climate change. But in the city, they are also facing climate change uncertainty. For example, short duration, heavy rainfall and water logging. So they lost everything in the rural context. Same thing happened in the urban context. Thank you. The urban and rural context that you mentioned are particularly interesting. Um, thank you for that perspective. Monir, let's stay with you. Can you tell us um, what services does BRAC provide to climate migrants in the receiving community to help them integrate into the new location, especially in a big city like Dhaka? Um, BRAC has 15 social develop, uh, development program in Bangladesh. Out of the uh, 15 program, 10 programs are directly working for the climate migrants in the city areas. The urban development program directly works with the climate migrants in 20 cities of the country. They make cities work for everyone. Their community-led approach ensure that people living in marginalized situation in the cities has access to livelihood opportunity and basic services. They partner with the city authorities to promote inclusive, gender responsive and resilient urban development. The program reduced multidimensional poverty and improved well-being of 1.4 million people living in the urban poverty, improved living standards of 2,000 500 people through low cost climate resilient housing initiative and many more. BRAC school development program has been providing skill training and employment related support to young people across Bangladesh, mostly urban context, focusing particularly on people living in vulnerable and hard to reach areas, people forced to migrate as a result of climate change and people forced into poverty by COVID-19. So every program basically have, have been providing support from their own scope to the climate migrant. Is it enough? I don't think so. The Climate Bridge Fund, another innovative approach by BRAC and KFW, a German bank, which is completely dedicated for the climate migrants. The fund have been providing financial support to, to the local NGO in five cities in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, Manir, and for the good work that BRAC is doing there on this issue. Sarah, let's move to you now. In our planning meeting, you told us the support a receiving community receives is the biggest determinant of whether this will be an opportunity or a crisis. How can a funder make it an opportunity and not a crisis? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's probably three, I'm gonna go through three main ways I think a funder or a supporter can make an opportunity instead of a crisis in the area of displacement due to uh, climate change. The first and foremost is to look for the opportunity. Uh, the former DG uh, William Swing has a quote. I can't remember the whole the whole quote, but the last part is migration is not a problem. It's a process and seeing human mobility and displacement as something that's a reality, something that is is part of the human story since since we've been recording that story uh, is a good place to start and, and seeing that m migration and displacement and mobility aren't going anywhere, it allows for us to see how human mobility can be part of a solution towards development, towards human rights-based approaches and towards conservation and creating sustainable, durable solutions. Um, a lot of times the emphasis on migration being the issue sometimes distracts from 
what is causing and how we can stop the, the issues that are causing migration that is not uh, equitable or human rights based um, in, in that process. The second is a lot of a lot of organizations that are addressing large scale displacement receive a lot of uh, restricted funding or specifically earmarked funding due to the nature of of donorship, specifically within the UN and with IOM, the majority of our funding comes from member states and member states are beholden to their constituents. So they are not able to provide funding that is, is flexible or softly earmarked. And in doing so, that means that organizations responding to very dynamic, varied contexts have a lot of limitations in what they actually are capable of doing. So if somebody would like to partner with an organization and has the opportunity to provide more softly earmarked funding that allows for organizations to invest in innovative approaches instead of just uh, addressing new problems with the same solutions. And then lastly, uh, the way a funder or supporter could um, help create opportunities out of crises is looking for organizations that are committed to empowering local communities and looking for organizations that are committed to empowering not just the local community of the host or the receiving community but also the migrant or the arriving community um i know we're going to talk more about uh the time i've spent in dolo uh later but um one thing that was the most say the most touching or the most empowering thing I heard um, in the time I spent in Somalia is the local leaders of Dolo telling us that our colleagues who come in day in and day out or weekly to this community are considered community members. And they see uh, the work that we're doing is something that is, is solution oriented for, for both parties and that helps, helps create social cohesion and also helps build towards opportunity instead of uh, further crisis. There's a number of um, great insights there, Sarah. Thank you. And I think process versus problem, that's that's excellent. Uh, Jono, we probably do not spend enough time working with the host or receiving community compared to the time spent with the sending community. What should a discussion look like with a potential host community? It's a great question, Austin. And I think in particular, um, listening, tons of listening with um, all the agencies that have traditionally provided support along a climate refugees journey and getting to know the community, um, whether they're in formal networks or more formalized committees and structures to help process not only just the logistics of, of providing support to those whose communities but many of the cultural and uh, psychological uh, elements that communities have to process. And um, when I reference back to my work with the community in La Penita along in that very small graphic at the bottom of the screen along the border with Colombia, this was a small town of 120 indigenous people who, as I mentioned in 2021 saw upwards of 40,000 climate refugees and other type of refugees passing through. And I think there tends to be, not just in this case, similar to what Sarah and Manir said, a real underestimation of the economic, psychological, and cultural impacts that this type of shock has in a community and frankly, not seeing it as an asset that can be leveraged to not only address the dignity and human rights that all passer throughs have, but also to help lift the host community up. As you can probably tell from the photo here, La Penita was not a well resourced community to begin with. So there were economic development opportunities to improve water and sanitation even just basic livelihoods for once unemployed residents of La Panita to think about how they could leverage their amazing strengths and skills to help support their new brothers and sisters that were passing through. So in, in short, I think that um, sounds so cliche sometimes to think about just listening and really sizing up from an anthropological or ethnographic perspective 
what the community is telling uh, itself and each other and us that we need, and importantly, making sure that we're drawing in localized resources. In many cases, I credit IOM, UNHCR, and many of the agencies from really hiring from within host communities to have those individuals best equipped to tell the outside world what was needed versus the assumptions that are often made. Compared to the local population, those are truly staggering numbers of people passing through. Thank you for that perspective and example. Sarah, you have been working with a small community in Somalia. Can you tell us about the issues they are facing as they have been receiving an influx of people due to climate change and what supports are needed there? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, so Somalia is a very unique, uh, it is in a unique situation because they have experienced repeated drought for the past several years. And as each year progresses, uh, the, the conditions get worse and you have communities who have been pastoral um, for their livelihoods for thousands of years who no longer have the opportunity to uh, have land that supports their livestock. And so they also lose their access to livelihood um, and increases scarcity and access to you know, life-saving resources, basic human needs, water, food, et cetera. Um, and I actually, a big, a big portion of, of these issues have to do with, with trees and access to trees. And so I, the last two pictures in the former side of the slide, I forgot to mention, you saw a lone tree in the desert, um, which we took right as, as we got off the plane um, on the border of Ethiopia and Somalia, where Dolo is located. And then there was also a picture of all of us sitting underneath this, this tree. And it was, it was labeled in our agenda for the day, uh, meeting with the town elders under the mango tree. And we were, we were quite surprised that it was quite literally a mango tree and, and it was considered almost sacred because it was one of the biggest trees still standing. Uh, trees have a lot of purpose uh, in an area where they're scarce. First and foremost, the brush, as you can see in the new shelter, uh, is used to build uh, temporary shelters. Uh, shelter is a huge issue for these communities receiving influxes of thousands of displaced people. Uh, the community itself is only a few thousand, so it's a significant increase in population size. Um, and IOM specifically tries to provide more medium term solutions uh, to reflect the reality of these people's uh, mobility being impacted for the long term. However, using brush decreases access to resources for fuel because trees are also used for fuel. Additionally, trees are also used to help water retention along the riverbed and there's a river that is uh, running between Ethiopia and, and uh, Somalia right at the Dolo, uh, Dolo sits alongside the river. And while we were there, the river was completely dry and they were discussing if and when and, and hopes of rain coming. A lot of people come to this river area in hopes to be able to access water because the water will be retained in the riverbed. However, because of this demand for fuel and the demand for materials for building shelter, there is uh, a decrease of trees maintaining the riverbed, so it also uh, impacts water retention. So you can see how something as simple as trees play a role in so many different ways in one community. Um, Dolo is also facing just scarcity of, like I said, base resources. Um, there's also the, the World Food Program is present in Dolo as well, but um, as situations have advanced elsewhere, as uh, attention has gone towards Ukraine, there's also uh, a decrease of resources being sent towards Somalia. Um, and that is, it's concerning, but also is, as, the, as the drought uh, continues, we really hope that people will see opportunity not just to meet immediate needs, which is first and foremost, food and water is, is a dire first and foremost need in a way that um, the Dolo community can be supported, but also we really need to be able to provide durable long-term solutions that reflect the reality of the problems they are facing. And I would say one of the biggest areas is specifically shelter innovation. Um, there's some irony in the ma majority of temporary shelters being in the form of plastic sheeting, which is not necessarily the most sustainable approach. But as we seek to innovate, there's a lot of barriers to what, what local communities have access to and what local communities have access to that is sustainable. And in my conversations with my colleagues uh, in Somalia, 
that is one of the things they spend a lot of time thinking about. I was actually up till like 11 p.m. having a brainstorming session on, on if we could get a 3D printer to Somalia to print houses for people. Um, these sorts of things are the kind of conversations that our colleagues have. And honestly, I think what Dolo would really benefit from is opportunity to think of new ways to address these issues that probably aren't going anywhere immediately. Um, as you can see in these pictures, you see uh, this woman standing here in this new shelter that was built by, by IOM and we supported uh, the communities uh, providing space for them to build their own, own temporary structures that should last five to 10 years in, those, in the current conditions. Um, and then also you see the camels grazing um, on the little bit of brush that remains. And if you see how you can tell how, how emaciated they are, it just shows the, the original issue of livestock no longer being able to be sustained on the land that they have been cultivated on, um, which requires innovative approaches to new uh, livelihood opportunities as well. Thank you. I think you touched on um, the complexity from, from local all the way to global and everything in between. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move in a few minutes to our question and answer section. So just a reminder to please use the Q&A tab at the bottom to add your questions for our speakers. But before we do that, Jono, one last question for you before we move to the um, audience discussion portion of the webinar, what are your recommendations for funders and what have you seen that did and did not work? I think in, in general, tied back to the earlier comment around host communities and entering into a, an authentic, really decolonialized manner with host communities and to size up what we've traditionally called a needs assessment is absolutely critical. I, I see so many positive examples where agencies have gone in and truly listened um, and really taken the feedback from the host community and really balanced that with, of course, the competing priorities, whether they're geopolitical priorities or especially for multilateral or nation states that often have uh, very uh, difficult jobs in, in balancing all the competing interests. Uh, but one of my, my favorite examples of this that I've shared with the donors um, really comes from uh, less of a climate migration and climate refugee perspective, but I think it really is transferable to the work that we're, we're doing across the globe. And this in particular came from the Ebola response back in 2013, where I was posted in Liberia. Uh, and we had a, a listening session, um, again, kind of wanting to better understand what the, the needs of the Liberian people were versus making assumptions around whether they need tarpaulin. Sarah's point around, you know, plastic sheeting continues to be a pervasive problem in, in shelters, um, as well as just really taking time to go through the healing process of talking about one's lived experience. And um, one of the young folks, uh, where I currently work with 13 to 23 year olds across the country, one of the young folks that attended this community meeting um, came up to me afterward and he said, Jono, I just wish people would, would realize, don't scratch me where I don't itch. And he had this uh, amazing way of, of really saying, like, ask. Um, and in his particular example, there were three separate agencies that provided the identical item um, that had nothing to do with what his family needed. And it's too small to read on the screen here. But in this particular case, uh, they were evicted from their home because of the stigma, uh, similar to the stigma that took place in the early days of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic. Uh, many folks that had Ebola in, in not just Liberia faced eviction and social stigma that was pervasive. And for his family, they didn't need three mattresses. They didn't need a hygiene kit. What they needed was support to keep their small business going. And I think this lesson is applicable when we're talking about climate refugees is really going back to, to really um, Patrick's uh, great wisdom, which is don't scratch me where I don't itch. And uh, a good friend of mine, um, Cheryl, uh, provided me this little sketch of those words and really with an emphasis of the power 
of listening. And I would just stress that to, to all of us that are looking at ways to make a dent into this phenomena that we see only getting worse in really employing those listening skills. Listen, listen, listen. Great message and, and beautiful artwork uh, to accompany that powerful message. So we have received several questions in advance and I will be working through that list as well as any that we receive in the question and answer box. As a reminder, CDP webinars are aimed at providing education for the philanthropic community. So while all are welcome to pose a question, we will first focus on those addressing funder issues. And the first question that I wanna start with is perhaps something that each of you could address. The case studies that we have looked at today are international focused. Do you have any thoughts on how we can translate this to the domestic setting here in the United States where displacement is also occurring and any thoughts for funders that may be operating in the space here? Why don't we start with you, Jono, if you don't mind. Yeah, Austin, it's, it's a great question. And I think one of the best things that we can do is talk about it. Uh, one of our advisors at the Climate Initiative, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, um, is a really pronounced climate scientist and currently the chief climate scientist at the Nature Conservancy. She has a great TED Talk. And she says the most important thing you can do to fight climate change is to talk about it. And I think in particular, there's been so much polarization within the United States. I grew up in Nebraska and was just sharing stories around our inability to sit down as families, as friends, as communities, and really dialogue around things that we may see from very different perspectives. So in short, I would say, if you haven't had a chance to check out Dr. Hayhoe's TED Talk, check it out. Um, talk about it because I think that really opens up some incredible opportunities, um, not again to polarize it, but to bring us to a solutions mindset. And Sarah, going to you, same question, you know, how can we help elevate this uh, discussion and, and what is happening in our own backyard here in the United States? Um, I, I and first and foremost, want to uh, second what John was saying. Uh, I think talking about it and talking about it in ways that doesn't just sound like it's being, you know, alarm raising, but also talking about the realities, the opportunities, and the impacts. Um, and to continue to plug the need for innovation, uh, what's happening in Somalia or elsewhere in the areas that we've discussed in Bangladesh and Panama, et cetera. Um, it may be starting there first, but it doesn't mean that we don't already see impacts uh, here stateside and domestically. And I think investing in innovative approaches to climate change now will help us in preparations for increased uh, impacts stateside. So I think first and foremost, talking about it engaging in discussion, brainstorming, having innovative approaches, and seeing how what's happening elsewhere isn't so far from happening here. Thank you. And finally, to you, Manir, I know you have many experience, years of experience in Bangladesh, but also globally and um, even here in the United States. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us on this question of um, how do we elevate this discussion here domestically, and how can we translate the learnings perhaps that we have internationally to the domestic setting? Austin, thank you for this uh, question. And also Sarah and John already uh, explained. Uh, but uh, one thing uh, always I, uh, I remember and also have seen in many places that the understanding of the climate change or the migration process. Sometimes we make complexity that which is due to climate change migration and which is regular migration. For example, that migration is one of the adaptation strategy, but that is skill migration. So in the local community, 
not even in Bangladesh or United States, uh, I have visited um, that uh, the uh, the uh, floor, uh, some places in Florida, and uh, I saw that they moved to another state. But if you ask them, they said, "Yeah, they love to go to that place." But if you try to figure it out why they are moving to this particular place to another place, the reason is climate change impact. So that understanding we have to uh, clear and the people uh, should know which is climate due to climate change and which is, which is regular migration or displacement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the three of you. Wonderful perspectives. Um, you know, we started this webinar talking about the term climate refugee and the importance of terminology. There's one question I'd like to ask, and um, perhaps, Sarah, we can begin with you. What are your thoughts between using the terms climate change versus the climate crisis? They're referencing the same phenomena. However, the latter ur adds urgency to an issue that is happening right now. What do you think on the, those, those two terms, crisis versus climate change, that is more commonly used perhaps? Well, I would say my first thoughts are the term crisis, although it connotates urgency, it also elicits fear. And I think we have a lot of crises discussed in our news cycles today. And so the term crisis almost does the opposite effect where people kind of want to turn their backs on the things that cause the greatest fear. And so change is a dynamic process and it's something that's not stagnant. It's something that's happening. And so I would maybe posit that the terminology is really dependent on the context. Is it discussing a specific um, situation or context where climate change has caused crisis. I would say, for example, Somalia or Bangladesh or Panama, the areas we've discussed um, today have pretty dire uh, impacts that would that lead to crisis. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the concept of the climate changing because of you know human impact, that also means that there is capacity for human impact to change perhaps in, in a better direction for us all. So I think that both terms have have relevance and have use and can have value. It just depends on context. But I think I think I prefer climate change because it sounds a bit more empowering than yet another crisis that we have to attend to. Thank you. Munir or Jono, would either of you like to comment on that? I'll jump in real quick just to say, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Sarah and one of the, not another textbook recommendation, but one of the great texts that I just finished is called Getting to the Heart of Science Communication. And it, it's very much that issue of context matters. Um, and Dr. Faith Kearns, uh, K-E-A-R-N-S is the author. And it really is a compelling story around the emerging literature that really does allow us to use different terms in different places. And uh, one of the examples that I often use, um, the climate initiative started in Kennebunkport, Maine, working with 13 to 23 year olds. We now have programming in 41 states and we use very different language in North Carolina where the state last year adopted a reg regulation that prohibits towns to take into consideration uh, sea level rise or changes as a result of sea level rise and um, future growth planning. And that's a very different conversation than in California. So we don't necessarily need to leave with climate crisis or climate change in those communities or even in Louisiana. We might just simply open up with a question about how are the places that we love changing and really making it about personal lived experience to avoid exactly that trap of possibly running into triggers that denote or connote something that is other than really what we're trying to mutually get at. Yeah, great perspective. Thank you for that, Jono. Munir, if, if you have any comments um, on that specifically, I'd welcome those, but I'd, I also want you to, because it's kind of related, 
uh, Munir, if you could speak to, there's a question about communication. And um, this person says, what do you think the best way to communicate the migration issues that communities have to city populations? And I'm thinking of you in particular because of what you've shared about the movement from rural areas to urban areas in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you. Uh, very recently, the Bragg Spark uh, there in Indian NGO and also ICAD, uh, International Center for Climate Change uh, and Development, which is led by uh, Dr. Salimul Haq. We started a project in Mongla. It's a different kind of project. And uh, basically that project, we named the approach is Local Adaptation Center. The Monglai is one sub-district of Bagarhat and uh, it's a, they are facing really a tremendous climate change impact. They don't have a, a single drop of fresh water in their locality. But these local adaptation center, they collect all the information from the community and they will prepare their action plan. Through the, they're taking from, uh, from, from the local adaptation center and which is, which is completely run by the mayor who is the elected from the uh, um, uh, community. So it's completely their own center and a group of expert, they will run this center, provide, uh, providing uh, the technical support, knowledge, so that they can take all like adaptation related, they can implement adaptation related activities, especially in, in their um, housing sector, in their wash sector, even in the livelihood sector. So the people who are facing this problem, as I mentioned, that when they move to the city, they also lived in the slum, which is the low-lying area in the city. They're facing problem in the rural uh, context. They're facing problem in the urban context. So they know how to survive with this context. So from the local adaptation center, we'll provide all sorts of uh, support, for example, training, capacity building training, livelihood training, so that they can change their life and make them more resilient to fight with the any kind of climate change impact. Thank you. Thank you, Manir, for that example. Communication is so important and terminology, of course, is as well. We're almost running out of time for questions, but I have um, one question I wanna ask and I'll direct it to uh, Sarah. I think a couple of you used uh, right um, terminology in some of your comments. There's, um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do we make any work with climate refugees or migrants rights-based? Or what do you think, Sarah, about a rights-based approach to this work? I'm struggling to see an alternative. So that's why there's a pause. Um, I think the work that we do um, as an organization is focused on creating safe, orderly, and humane pathways for people who experience uh, displacement or have mobility circumstances. They're not necessarily uh, elective or by choice. So forced mobility, forced migration usually has a component of, of desperation or of lack of access to a basic need. And I think in the world we have today, uh, with increasing factors causing uh, mobility, displa mobility issues and displacement, um, treating individuals with dignity and with an understanding of their 
um, the space they take and the space they deserve allows for us perhaps to also look at the space we take and the space that that we deserve um, in a world that needs us to be more focused on sustainability. And so I think that if we want to combat the reality of climate change and see decreases and in, in crises because of um, our impacts on our climate, the understanding of, of human dignity helps connect us to one another and it's our collaborative group effort. I think that um, highlighting the dignity and the rights of an individual in collective community allows for us to best engage a solution with, with all parties at the table um, and all stakeholders present. I think that's the true way to be innovative. Um, I think it's the kind of the foundation for creating sustainable, a sustainable world uh, for all who, who live within it. Thank you. I think that's um, a brilliant way to wrap up our Q&A portion, focusing on the rights and dignity of individuals. That's all the time that we have for questions today, but as we begin to wrap up, I wanna provide the audience with some resources. In 2019, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction partnered with the Platform on Disaster Displacement and the Norwegian Refugee Council to produce the Words into Action Guidelines on Disaster Displacement. The goal of the guidelines is to explain how governments can practically implement Sendai Framework Target E to reduce the risk of disaster displacement and related human suffering. We will provide a link to the document and the follow-up email after the webinar, but I wanted to share their six steps for action with you. Avoid displacement and strengthen resilience. Prepare for unavoidable displacement. Respond. Support resilience of displaced and host populations find durable solutions, and assess over time. Also, our friends at Giving Compass have an extensive resource on climate migration. They have also created four paths that donors can follow to climate solutions. Give to organizations that address the root causes of climate change. Invest in mitigation and adaptation efforts to help insulate communities from the effects of climate change. Support disaster relief efforts to address the acute needs of climate refugees and would-be climate refugees, and fund nonprofits that support effective rehoming and societal integration efforts for immigrants and communities and refugees. I'm sorry. As funders and responders, we are fortunate that others have been thinking of these issues already. Lead with Listening is a guidebook for practitioners and community leaders with insights for beginning community conversations on climate migration. If we begin to have conversations now on climate migration with those most affected, grounded in community-led process and planning, we can reduce harm, save lives, and cre create equitable responses that lead to better futures for those who will want and need to move and those communities that welcome them. The Climate Migration Network launched this project to close the gap in lived experience between practitioners and frontline communities considering relocation. We'll provide a link to the guidebook in the follow-up email, but I want to highlight a couple insights from it. Enter community members as experts with the question, how am I building on the lived experience of community members? Community members, as we have heard from our panelists today, are the experts on their lived experience. They are already witnessing the impacts that climate models and policy briefs discuss, and it is imperative that their narrative and knowledge be listened to first. Next is recognize power structures. Higher income communities and individuals have more choice about where and when to move. The typic they typically have more access to the job market than lower income communities. Consider that power disparities may mean that communities depend on powerful interests such as fossil fuel community companies to fund social services or other basic infrastructure and how that may affect the conversation. You can find many resources that can assist you on CDP's website. We have a relatively new website. I encourage you to check that out. The issue insights provide an introductory look at disasters and responses. We have profiles that provide regular information about the impact of a disaster and the needs of the community to inform philanthropy on how they can help. Please join us on our next webinar on August 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. 
beyond the typical grant, alternative ways to fund disasters. In order to respect everyone's time and keep this to an hour, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's webinar. Thank you to our co-sponsors and to Manir, Sarah, and Jono for taking their time to share their insights with us. Please take a moment to complete our post-webinar survey to let us know what you liked and what you would like to see in future webinars. It will pop up automatically when you exit the webinar. If you have questions or thoughts that were not addressed during today's webinar, you may email them to tanya at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you all very much and have a great afternoon.